we are going to get started. Um, I'm going to first introduce myself. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Paige Corley, and I am a health educator with Salt Lake County uh, Aging and Adult Services. And I know many of you from the various classes that um, I teach online or uh, in the senior centers. And today, uh, let's see, I, I, I usually we give a little background on our speakers. Um, let's see, I've been in the fitness biz for 25 years. You know, I started off as a group exercise instructor and made my way through various pathways to uh, my present job, which I really enjoy a ton. Uh, I'm currently a student at the University of Utah in their gerontology program. And I'm loving that. It's just a very interesting course of study and I'm learning all sorts of new things. Um, the university has opportunities of lifelong learning for older adults where you can audit classes for a nominal fee for any of you who are interested in continuing education. Just a little plug there for you. Um, and for today's uh, presentation, we're gonna be talking about how to manage arthritis. and I'm gonna let you all know, this is kind of a different type of presentation. Usually I make my own, but this presentation is actually one that was made by a different organization um, that I'm a part of that's called the Modern Management of the Older Adult. And it is a group of um, personal, um, physical therapists, and I'm not a physical therapist, um, but I, I worked my way in to this group uh, and so I'm on their email uh, list and I've taken a couple of different online courses with them. And they're a group of uh, physical therapists, like I said, who are focused on working with older adults. And there's a, a smaller group uh, called the Institute of Clinical Excellence. And that's who I've taken my online classes from. And they're a group of physical therapists who are devoted to not treating older adults like they're old. Um, and as we know, when we get older, we tend to get injured, right? We, we and, and instead of sending us to a person who's going to push us to be in the best shape possible, as older adults are often put with physical therapists who treat us like we're old, right? They have us do ankle circles and we're lifting little bitty weights. And these physical therapists are like, hey, we're sick of underdosing and underserving our older adults. These people are gonna live for another 20 years. We need to treat them as if they're living, right? And so that's who made this uh, presentation. I have been authorized to present it, um, but I did wanna make sure that I give credit to uh, the people who created it. Um, so you'll see pictures of people um, that you might not know it's not local. Anyway, we're gonna get started. Um, there we go. So we're gonna talk about what is arthritis and what can we do about it now? And I wanted to let you know that I do welcome your questions. If you have a question, unmute yourself, interrupt me, that's okay. Uh, I very much in, invite your, uh, your topics, your questions. And if I can't answer them, if they're out of my scope of practice, I will let you know that. Um, all right, okay. So we're gonna talk about arthritis and what is what, it? What, let's talk about um, arthritis. And the little thing on the, on the side of the, the slide here says, I, can, I, I can't exercise. I have bone on bone arthritis. And as a personal trainer, as a exercise physiologist, as a um, group exercise instructor, I hear this all the time. I can't exercise because I have arthritis. And just to let you know, that is absolutely false, right? You can't exercise even though you have arthritis. And arthritis is an umbrella term that represents a lot of different types of, of arthritis. And arthritis is not just wear and tear. It is more than, more than that. All right, there we go. Sorry. Uh, it is not just wear and tear. I think a lot of times arthritis, we think is, oh, I'm just getting older, right? That's one of the things I'm learning about a lot in school is ageism. And it's not just young people who are ageist against older people. It's old people who are ageist against themselves. Oh, I'm old. That's why I hurt. No, no. 
that's not necessarily why you hurt. There might be other things we can do to minimize that. So it's not just wear and tear. There are other things going on in your body. Uh, the most common symptoms of arthritis are pain, swelling, and stiffness. And key factors, things that, that are associate, associated with arthritis are inflammation, and we're gonna talk about this quite a bit, inflammation, body weight, and previous injury. So not just wear and tear, but if you injured your knee at any point in your life, you are more prone to get arthritis in that knee. Um, and we're gonna talk a lot about how body weight affects our uh, uh, chances of getting arthritis and how inflammation in the body uh, leads to that as well. And overall, uh, inflammation in general is bad for, you know, it's not good for your body. It leads to breakdown of the cartilage that helps support your joints and reduce friction when movement is generated. So, you know, in between our joints, we have uh, synovial fluid. We also have little pads and we have inflammation. And when I say inflammation, what I mean is that just how you can imagine if you got bit by a spider and you reacted and that area got red and maybe warm, that's inflammation. But it's the same thing inside of our body. And when we have that, um, especially chronically, it can really have negative effects on our joints. All right, so let's talk about some types of arthritis. And uh, many of us know about osteoarthritis. In fact, there's probably somebody on this call, if not multiple people on this call, who have osteoarthritis. It is the most common type. Um, 52 million people actually are uh, affected by uh, osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is a little bit different style, and we're going to talk more about each one of them. Um, ankylosing spondylitis. Spondylitis. Yeah, I'm not good at pronouncing stuff. I was learned phonetics as a child, so you know it's gone. Um, but this one, ankylosing spondylitis. spondylitis. <laughs> We're going to talk about that one. That is actually a um, type of arthritis, and and it's come into my life recently where I've had a good friend who was recently diagnosed with this type of arthritis. She's in her 40s. And psoriatic or uh, arthritis is another one. And there's other kinds, but those are the ones that we're going to go over uh, today. And arthritis is one of those things, it's kind of like gray hair. As we age, our hair may turn gray. Many of us, our hairs turn gray. That's, that is part of aging. Um, but and it's, it's the same way as, uh, with arthritis. Arthritis is kind of part of aging. Um, and at the same time, there it's not something that we just need to accept, like, oh, I have arthritis, so there's nothing I can do about it. Um, and it's not always painful. So all of us on this webinar might have joint degeneration, but only 20% of us are going to have pain from that joint degeneration. So even if you have a bit of joint uh, degenerative joint issues, you might not have uh, pain with them. And the reason I bring that up is we all need to think about preventative measures for uh, for arthritis. And I bet some of you know what the preventative measure is that I'm going to talk about. I bet you do. We're going to get to it in just a second, though. All right, so let's talk about osteoarthritis. This is the most common type of arthritis. 20% um, of the United States population has arthritis. So 30 million, sorry, 52 million have arthritis as a general term. 30 million have osteoarthritis. And it's most common in joints, like the hips and the knees, the back, that DDD acronym is degenerative disc disease. Um, I, I put some notes here so that I can remember and make sure that I am saying yes, degenerative disc disease. And that's a symptomatic description of osteoarthritis in the back, stenosis is also something that we hear about, and obviously in our hands. And I think we're, a lot of us are very aware of hands. You see it on people a little bit more. You can tell that they have inflammation in their hands, um, as opposed you might not see it as much in their hips. But mainly it's kind of the extremities that we get the osteoarthritis. 
risk factors to osteoarthritis, there's some that are non-modifiable. So again, age, it is a risk factor. We are more prone to it. Um, and there's nothing we can do about aging, nor would we necessarily really want to. It's a natural part of life. The difference is we want to age as healthily as possible, right? Is we want to make that aging process as positive as possible. Uh, any previous in injuries, as I said, are going to be more prone to uh, developing arthritis and other chronic conditions that you might have. Again, especially chronic conditions that also come with inflammation, and we're gonna we'll talk about that. The modifiable ones. Uh, are one is being overweight. And remember, if you've been in any of my webinars, I'm very quick to remind you that overweight means, doesn't mean carte blanche losing weight. What it means is finding a healthy weight for your body. And that's for no one to decide except you. It's not a cookie cutter thing. You can be uh, underweight and that's not a, a healthy weight. And you can be overweight, but that doesn't mean that, that you need to lose a ton of weight. What you need to do is, is manage your body weight to the point where your, joint, your joints are not overburdened by that extra body weight. Um, also, low muscle strength. Um, our muscles act as springs on our joints. And this was interesting, I thought, when I listen to this presentation, um, the muscles, and I already knew this, right? Our bones don't move unless our muscles move, right? If you really think about it, right? Our skeleton without our bone, without our muscles is just gonna be a pile of bones. So we move our uh, bones with our muscles and there's a lot of positives that come out of that. And one is it cushions the blow that goes to the joint. So if you have weak muscles, and you're overweight, your joints are getting a double whammy, which is making them more prone to arthritis. Um, so both the, the overweight and low muscle strength oftentimes come together, meaning that's a package deal. People have both of them. Um, and then again, other chronic conditions, anything that causes inflammation in your body, and that could be diabetes, uh, uh, heart, disease, there's all sorts of things. And again, if you have questions, comments, uh, uh, unmute, let me know, or put it in the chat. Rheumatoid arthritis. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. And I'm sure some of you out there know that autoimmune means that kind of means our body's attacking itself, right? Our body's actually causing harm to our body, which is a real bummer. Um, and that's what rheumatoid arthritis is, and that's different than osteoarthritis. It's common in the smaller joints, so the hands and the wrists and the feet. It's usually diagnosed uh, between 40 and 60 years. That's usually when people develop it, although not always, but that's usual. And it can uh, impact your eyes, your central, uh, your cardiovascular system, and you can just be uh, tired. Uh, just kind of general fatigue. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of things that make us tired, right? There's a different kind of tired. There's tired after you exercise. There's tired after you've gone uh, all day to a museum. And there's tired when you have rheumatoid arthritis, right? Some can be explained, some can't. So it's more of that kind of chronic, chronic uh, fatigue. Risk factors for rheumatoid arthritis. Non-modifiable, age again, females are more prone to getting um, rheumatoid arthritis. I'm not really sure why that is. I didn't pick up an explanation that I felt that, that, that I could share that, that made any sense. And of course, family history. Um, so it, rheumatoid arthritis is, uh, again, kind of an um, umbrella term in and of itself that refers to any inflammation in the joint. And just like cancer, which can refer to many different types, you know, arthritis can do that same thing. So rheumatoid arthritis is, is similar like that. Um, 
And again, sometimes these, these things, there is a family history to rheumatoid arthritis. If you're prone to inflammation, um, you, it can be something that is passed down to you. Modifiable ones are kind of the same thing we talked about with osteoarthritis. Uh, overweight, um, I'm sure low, uh, overweight obviously is gonna be one of the, the modifiable risk factors. Smoking, right? Um, and then different aspects of your environment. And I think that basically means it, if uh, it could be your outside environment, particulates in the air, things that, that cause inflammation in your body, and also things that you put into your body. And we're gonna, again, I keep saying that, but we are gonna talk about inflammation. I don't wanna talk about it until we, we actually get there to really talk about it specifically. There are medications. Let me think I needed to make some notes on this. Slide 11, okay. So medications for the treatment of uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the first one is NSAIDs, and that stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory anti drugs. And we know NSAIDs, right? We Ibuprofens, naproxens, th those kind of things that we buy over the counter, they can be prescribed. And one of the things that we need to be aware of with NSAIDs is they can, if, if you're taking them, chronically, like all the time, they can have some negative uh, side effects to uh, your body. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we get into the, the presentation. Methotrexate, methotrexate, I'm gonna read this. Uh, this is disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. So this drug, tries to identify different parts of the inflammatory cascade. Because it is a chain reaction, so inf inflammation is a chain reaction. One thing causes it and another thing happens, another thing happens, and then all of a sudden you're on that cascade of inflammation. And the methotextate stops that cascade. It finds something in that cascade and takes it out hoping to stop that forward motion, if that makes sense to you. So if you're on that, so it kind of, it kind of takes a player out of the game so it can, can stop that reaction that's happening in your body. Um, then there's some other, there's other drugs that, that maybe these uh, make sense to you. The biologics, they target different molecules in the, again, they do the same thing in the inflammation cascade, uh, to reduce that autoimmune response. Um, so all of, the, all of these things are kind of anti-inflammation drugs. They just all act a little bit differently. And this is outside of my scope. I'm not a pharmacist. I don't know about them, but some of you that might be on some of these medications, you need to know what are they doing? How are they affecting your arthritis? And is there any long-term negative to taking that drug. So the next time, the next kind is one that I can't pronounce for some reason. A, yeah, anyway, we're gonna call it AS, all right? Just for ease of presentation. And this one's interesting. Like I said, I have a friend who just got diagnosed with it and this one actually affects the spine and the SI joints and the ribs and all that, the, the cartilage and everything else that's in between those little joints in our spine as opposed to our extremities. And usually women get this more than, I mean, men get this more than women. Um, and it's usually diagnosed before 40. And what happens is the little areas between the, like the spine, let's just take that for example, you know how it, it moves, right? But it doesn't move a ton, but that cartilage in between it starts to calcify. So all of a sudden that your movement in your spine becomes less and less. And you can see on that picture, uh, this is an example of the kind of the posture that accompanies AS. The problem is a lot of people stand like this that don't have AS, right? They're just not paying attention to the posture or maybe they have uh, you know, curvature of the spine or an injury, other things. 
but so that's not always the only way that you can you know be wonder if you have AS. Um, the treatment is very similar to the other um, types of arthritis. We're looking at um, reducing inflammation, um, but the key to AS and and mitigating its progression is movement. Oddly enough, right? If we if we can keep those joints moving and keep that calcification from happening, then we can mitigate the progression of that disease. But if we think, oh, I have this type of arthritis and maybe I am in a little bit of pain, so I'm not going to move, then that calcification is going to take hold and then the movement is going to be forever uh, modified or, or reduced. So giving away a little bit on the exercise and how that's uh, involved in arthritis. So psoriatic arthritis, it's often challenging to diagnose and it might be misdiagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis. So if your rheumatoid, if you test negative for the rheumatoid factor in rheumatoid arthritis and you have uh, psoriasis, then most likely you have psoriatic uh, arthritis. And this is a genetic disease, it's an autoimmune disease, and it's named for psoriasis that, that accompanies it. Um, nail and skin symptoms, precede the arthritis in 75% of the cases. So you're gonna see a change in um, your skin, in your fingernails. I, I'm pretty sure these are probably pretty extreme pictures. So I don't know that you have to have such extreme changes in your nails uh, to, to suspect this. And I think at this point in our lives, if we have psoriasis, we might know that we have psoriasis. Um, but either way, uh, that is what, uh, um, let's see, it says onychosis, and I'm sure I am mispronouncing that, O-N-Y-C-H-O-L-Y-S-I-S, -S, is a common nail disorder. It's a loosening or separation of a fingernail or toenail from its nail bed, and it usually starts at the tip of the nail and progresses back. That's what you're seeing in some of these pictures, and that usually accompanies psoriatic arthritis. Um, all right. And again, same treatments uh, with drugs, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs. And oh, look at that, exercise. Exercise is a key uh, factor in mitigating the symptoms, reducing the damage associated with psoriatic arthritis. And even the Arthritis Foundation is starting to really push exercise as a treatment, rather than filling our bodies with these drugs, limit, you know, there are some, some pharmaceuticals I have to take too for different conditions I have, but I wanna minimize those. Anything that I can control through exercise, I'm gonna do that so that I, the ones that I can't, then I can leave that for the pharmaceutical intervention. So those are the four main types of arthritis. There's others, those, those are gonna cover most of what uh, people experience. So now let's talk about what can we do about it? Okay, so short term, um, and we're gonna talk about these in, in length. So we have ice versus heat, pain meds, stretching, ultrasound, acupuncture, electric stem, injections and joint repair. Those are all short term remedies and long term or joint replacements. And then we have a special secret weapon that we're gonna talk about. So let's talk about these short-term uh, uh, ways that we can mitigate or attack these, these symptoms or the progression of uh, arthritis. So ice versus heat, and this is a pretty common question, even I get it just in exercise, what should I use? And I was very happy to hear the, the answers because I, I agreed with them, so yay on that. Um, heat is usually what you want to go for when treating uh, arthritis pain, because that brings blood to the area, right? And blood has nourishment uh, to it. And one of the one of the problems is uh, 
if you use ice before you move, ice also helps with pain, excuse me, let me start over. So ice and heat both can help with pain. The problem with ice is if you're going to move your body, you don't wanna ice it before you move because that stiffens the joint up. It, it, minim, it, it takes away mobility, whereas ice increases mobility. So you, if you want to treat your pain with uh, something and you know that you're gonna be moving that day, choose heat. If it's at the end of the day and you're done with all your activities and you want to uh, apply ice to help minimize pain, great, that is a time to use to use ice. Hopefully that make, uh, uh, makes, makes sense to you. Um, let's see here. So it talks about gout. Um, we don't really talk about gout, but they do kind of hit on it here in relation to uh, ice and heat. And a gout's gonna be, um, I think the one of the ones where uh, it's same idea. If you're gonna go out moving, you're gonna wanna use that heat, but ice is a great way for non-pharmaceutical pain release relief um, that you can, you know, that you can use. And obviously you, there's lots of different ways to apply ice. You can use an ice bag, bag. you can. They, has anybody heard of cryotherapy? That's like cold therapy. It's either a cold water plunge or going into a room that's really cold. It's being used by a lot of athletes these days. It's basically just a fancy way to ice your body and take away inflammation. Ice also takes away inflammation, with, which is help. It's temporary, but that's part of why it helps uh, reduce pain. So let's talk about those pain meds. Um, so there's so many pain medications. And as I said earlier, they're the biggest are those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And if you're not sure if you're taking one of those, it'll say NSAID, that N-S-A-I-D, it'll say that on, on, the, on the bottle that you get. Um, but you can see your Celebrex, Advil, Aleve, you know, those kind of things. Um, those, if you take them chronically, they can cause uh, gastric bleeding. And I know many of us have heard of this. Um, I'm just making sure I have looked at all of my slides here. Yeah, gastric bleeding. And it's a serious problem. So you don't want to abuse the insects. Now, I know some people have chronic pain and that's how they that, that's how they manage their pain. That's when you go to your doctor, talk to your doctor. Is there something else? Is there some other way I can manage my pain, either pharmaceutically or through some other means to minimize how much I'm taking these insets? The other thing is, if you don't take these drugs that often, they are like wonder drugs. It's amazing how well they take care of your pain. But like any drug, if you take it often, the effects start to minimize, right? So you have to take more and more and more to get the same effect. So if you can, and I'm again, I know there are people that have chronic pain. All I'm saying is talk to your healthcare provider, make sure that there's not a better way to manage your pain besides chronic use of, uh, of insects. Stretching. Um, stretching can be good, you know, any movement, can, is good. When we move our joints, we release synovial fluid, as I mentioned earlier, and that's actually a fluid for our joints that's kind of like, um, it has nutrients in it. It's kind of like uh, engine oil to the pistons. And I don't even know if engines are like this anymore, right? Do engines even have pistons anymore? But if you have a piston and you don't have engine oil on it, it is gonna break that motor pretty quickly. Same thing with that synovial fluid. But the great thing is when you move your joint, it automatically appears in your joint. And it, it adds nutrients to your joint and it helps protect it, it adds that glide. So anytime you can move your body, it's a good thing. Um, and stretching should feel like a gentle tension. Stretching should never be painful. It can be uncomfortable. I mean, I always say, Discomfort's one thing, pain is another. Um, 
you want to warm up first. And again, so you don't want to ice the joint and then stretch it, right? You want to warm it up with heat, then warm it up with movement, and then stretch it. We don't want to stretch a cold joint. It, it can add, uh, it can produce temporary relief of pain. It's a natural way to relieve pain. So it might be something for those of you who are trying to minimize that NSAID use that you could try and see if that would minimize. Let's say it takes you from taking four NSAIDs a day to one if you were to try this. Um, so yeah, stretching. If you're like me, I don't love stretching. I, I really have to make myself stretch, but I always feel better after I stretch. So I'm getting better and better at doing it. So here are the things that are kind of outside of my scope of practice as, a, as, as the person speaking to you. But as a regular person, um, I have had some experience with these treatments, ultrasound, acupuncture, electric stem. If you've ever been to a physical therapist, you've probably had one or all of these treatments. Um, and they're thought to block uh, pain signals. Um, but there's still a lot of question marks. Research doesn't support the use of these uh, treatments as much as we'd like to think. You know, it, because you go into a physical therapist and their first thing is, oh, I'm going to do an ultrasound, I'm going to do some electric stem. <clears throat> there's not enough research really supporting that quick reaction to those, to those treatments. Um, there's some benefit for acute knee pain from osteoarthritis uh, with these treatments. And the, uh, they say about the ultrasound that it's as effective if it's plugged in or not plugged in, meaning that there's a big placebo effect associated with, with the ultrasound. And I'm all about placebo effects, man, especially if it's not invasive, right? If, Putting a little thing on your joint makes you feel like it feels better, do it, right? Um, but that's what they're saying is that the ultrasound, there's just not as much uh, research to back it. Um, it's not saying it's wrong. It's just uh, we, we still have a ways to go to really find out if these things make as much of a difference as, uh, as, as you would think. Cortisone injections. <clears throat> There's probably somebody in this meeting who has had a cortisone injection. I know someone who's had one. It seemed quite painful, I have to say. I was there uh, with them at the time. Um, and this is used for pain management. Um, you can only have one ejection every three months, so that's one a quarter. And really, this is not something that you're supposed to use as a regular treatment. There's a time and a place for a cortisone injection, but it's not all the time. It's something that can be used. The idea is if you're in really bad pain, you do the cortisone injection, and then you do other things to help with that pain, not just rely on that cortisone injection. As it says here, it's deep into the joint. It is. It can be quite quite painful. It looked like it wasn't fun. He survived. He was fine, but in the moment it seemed like it was uh, uncomfortable. And what they're injecting in there is anesthetic and corticosteroid. And they have to get really close to the point that is inflamed and uh, causing the pain for these things to take, uh, to take effect. And so that's why they have to get it so deep into the joint. So again, cortisone injections, time and a place, but it's not all the time and it's not forever. So um, this is another thing that they kind of got into that I don't really understand a lot of. So I'm gonna read a little bit because I wanna make sure that I do cover these. So the platelet rich plasma is probably the most widely performed of these procedures. Blood is drawn from the patient and spun in a centrifuge to separate the platelets from other blood components. The platelets are then injected into the problem area. So how it works is your body's first response to injury is to, is to send platelets to the site. 
and the blood component contains growth factors and other nutrients. Um, and so plasma rich, platelet rich plasma is thought to boost that natural response, right? So it's just kind of taking a response and then our, uh, um, artificially recreating that same response by putting those platelets in there. And the benefits of uh, PRP, as we're gonna call it, platelet-rich plasma, is done fairly quickly and, gener and generally requ requires only one injection. It provides symptomatic relief that may last three to six months. In some studies, PRP outperformed and sometimes outlasted hyaluronic acid and corticosteroid injections. But does it have a benefit that goes beyond pain relief? We just don't know. And that's a quote from Dr. Christer Evans, who's the director of Mayo Clinic's Musculoskeletal Skeletal Gene Therapy Research Lab. So keep in mind, studies suggest that preparation method, the type of centrifuge used, and even the delivery method can significantly affect results of PRP. And most insurance don't cover PRP, and out of pocket can be 500 to 2,000 per injection. So let's talk about autologous condition serum. It's called orthokine in Europe um, and reginokine in the United States. And this ACS uses a patient's own blood to fight pain. Your blood is processed to increase the anti-inflammatory proteins and growth factors it contains. And it's in, in fact injected into your affected joint um, in a series of, sh of shots. So again, we're taking the body's natural response, recreating it artificially out here, and then injecting it into the body. I like where it's coming from. I like these ideas uh, of, of treatments. Um, the Dr. Evans, who I quoted in the last one, says the treatment is safe and well tolerated. And like PRP, study shows only symptoms of relief, but no tissue regrowth. So all you're doing is getting rid of pain, which is huge, not, not trying to minimize that. Getting out of pain is great. Um, ACS is expensive as well, $10,000 a session. So you gotta have some money um, to be doing this. Um, and it's more commonly used for muscle, tendon, and ligament dam damage than it is for arthritis, but it is, it is used for arthritis. Oh, uh, whoops. All right, stem cells, right? Where the idea is we're taking these cells that haven't quite decided what they're gonna be and injecting them into uh, the arthritic area, hoping that we'll create new cells and maybe new cartilage, um, but, our evidence is poor right now, no FDA approvals. It's still in the experimental stage, so more to come on stem cell. And then cartilage repair and restoration. Um, so this is when small holes or tears develop in cartilage, usually as a result of injury, they can leave areas of bare bone. Over time, these can lead to osteoarthritis. Filling them with repair tissue can relieve pain, improve function, and delay or prevent the need for surgery later on. Later on. <clears throat> and a few different uh, types of uh, ways of doing this uh, are, are out there. But again, as you can see, really expensive, $14,000 to $40,000 uh, per treatment. <clears throat> It is successful though, usually 88% of patients return uh, to whatever sport they're playing or whatever activity they're doing. Um, but again, it is really uh, expensive and it doesn't really say if insurance covers it. But you can see there are definitely treatments out there to uh, repair joints that have either been injured or are, are really ravaged by uh, by arthritis. So let's talk about the long-term joint replacement. And again, somebody listening might have a joint replacement. Uh, it is, I don't want to say it's common. It seems like it is. I know a lot of people with joint replacements. 
Um, the pros are, it really does help with pain after you heal from the surgery, right? After you heal from the surgery, most people do say they do not have any more pain and it's a long fix, 15 to 25 years. Um, so, you know, that's great. Uh, the cons is you're still going through surgery. Uh, recovery can be really tough. It depends on what kind of shape you're in before you go in. Uh, and that's going to uh, give me a, a, well, I'm going to talk about it in just a, just a moment. Um, so yeah, recovery can be tough. Uh, sometimes they need to go in and do some revisions to it. Uh, obviously you're going into surgery. Um, that's a big one, right? You're going into surgery and people have varied capacities for surgery. But if you can do it, joint replacement does seem to have some, some really good uh, effects um, for people. And now they're doing uh, partial knee replacements instead of full knee replacements using, like if you have some things in there that are good, they don't just automatically cut them out and put it in an, uh, an, art, an artificial joint, they'll keep what they can. So that's great. Okay, so let's talk about the secret weapon. And y'all know what this is, exercise. And this is a picture of actually a lady who is involved with the organization that made this, uh, this presentation. Um, it's not uncommon. I think we all need to get used to seeing older people doing real exercise. These barbells with, with plates on the side of them. The things that we usually reserve for bodybuilders or athletes, that we are those people. We need the same equipment to produce the same effects in different ways, right? The other thing is healthy eating, exercise and healthy eating. Those are the secret weapons to arthritis and 14,000 other things. But we're talking about arthritis, so I'm just going to stick with arthritis, right? So what happens when we combine exercise with healthy eating? is we lose weight or we find our healthy weight, right? If we move our bodies and fill it with good fuel, our bodies will find that weight that's healthy for us. And that will help to reduce uh, inflammation in our bodies. That will help to support our joints. When we lose weight, like I've said earlier, it really helps to reduce the impact on our joints. And, uh, the other thing is if we, um, here we go, the risk of knee osteoarthritis increases five times when we're considered overweight or obese. So right there's a risk factor, five times more at risk for developing osteoarthritis by being overweight. And you can affect your weight. It might not be the funnest thing, but you can. And it can be at any age. You're never too old to do this. In fact, we can't be too old because we're living longer and longer and longer, right? It used to be 65 was old, and now we're living 20 years past that on average. That means some people are living 30 or 40. That's a long life if we don't treat ourselves as if, hey, I want to live this with, with some health and some mobility. Inflammation. We talk about inflammation a lot. Inflammation can lead to pain and joint breakdown. Inflammation can be caused by different diseases. But what we're finding is inflammation is actually more of a fuel for different diseases than a byproduct. Does that make sense? If you're in a state of chronic inflammation, you are more prone to developing certain diseases. And those diseases are cardiovascular disease, arthritis, diabetes is even linked to inflammation. And sometimes we get inflammation from our environment, from the, the fires, from the secondhand smoke in our house. But we also get inflammation from what we put in our mouths. Processed foods, right? maybe even healthy food, but that you have an adverse uh, um, relationship with. I'm gonna pick on dairy for a moment because I happen to be lactose intolerant. 
So if I were to be hard headed and say, I'm going to drink dairy, I don't care. I'm going to be in a state of inflammation because my body doesn't like lactose. It doesn't, it gets very upset. And so when I eat it and I have that, that, um, digestive reaction, all I'm doing is inflaming my stomach and all my digestive tract. And if I continue to do that, and my digestive tract and my stomach live in a state of inflammation for 10 or 20 years, they are gonna be more prone to infection or to disease. So that's part of why we really want to um, eat healthy. And, and an easy way to say what's healthy is plants, vegetables, whole foods, get rid of processed foods. I know we can't get rid of all processed foods, I get that, but minimize it. Minimize the processed foods that you're taking in and maximize those whole foods, the vegetables, the um, fruits. And remember, maybe some of those vegetables don't work well with you. Maybe broccoli really causes digestive issues for you, then, then cut that out of your, of your diet. Some healthy foods are unhealthy for you right? But we need to figure that out. We need to figure out what are those. So that's why we want to really think about what we're eating. And then we want to work out and exercise, especially weight training. Weight training is so important um, so that we have those muscles to support the joints when we move around. So your body needs to be strong enough to handle what you're asking it to do. And you all heard me say this. What's, what's important in your life? What do you value? If you want to walk your dog, if you want to play with your kids or your grandkids, if you want to travel, if you want to garden, if you want to play a sport, if you want to do your own laundry, if you want to grocery shop on your own, all of that's exercise. Picking up a, a laundry basket is a deadlift. It is, right? Reaching up overhead to put your groceries in the cupboard is an overhead press. These are all the exercises that we have you do in different uh, classes so that we can have your body be strong enough to do the things that you wanna do. And here's what we're looking for. We wanna increase our capacity for as long as we can. And if you look at this chart, that red line, below that we lose function. This is just you know kind of a, a visual representation. And you can see there's that natural decline that happens as we age but we have the ability to expand, the, the, to stave off, if you will, dipping below that functional line. And how do we do that? Through exercise, through healthy eating. Those are two big components of doing that. So that we don't reach that below that red line at 60, we might reach it at 95 instead. We wanna prolong it as long, push it off as long as possible. And here's that cycle of arthritis. We get arthritis, we have joint pain, and we think, oh, well, I don't wanna move because it hurts. So what do we do? We don't move. And what happens? We gain weight or we lose muscle or both. And then we get more arthritis, right? So it, it's a, a um, I used to call it a snowball effect. We're always in a snowball effect. We're either in a snowball effect to something that's detrimental or we're in a snowball effect to something that's beneficial. If you have pain, you stop moving, you're going to have a snowball effect towards muscle loss, weight gain, more pain, more muscle loss, more weight gain, and you are not staving off getting below that functional line. But if you exercise and you eat healthy and you get good sleep, you're going to feel better and you're going to do more exercise and you're gonna sleep better and you're gonna to wanna to eat better because you feel better and all of a sudden you're on this uh, snowball effect towards benefit, right? We're always on one or the other, it seems like, or, or maybe for a little while we're, we're level, but somewhere in there we're on both. So we wanna get rid of that movement. We wanna get rid of not moving. We wanna move our bodies. Um, even if it hurts, I'm not saying during a flare up to, to go out and exercise hard, but I am saying that if, even if you're in a little bit of pain, trust the process, see if 
if, if by going to the arthritis exercise foundation program, you know, that we have at the different gyms or going to enhance fitness or going to Tai Chi or going to Zumba, right? Whatever class you might like at your uh, senior center or the gym that you go to and just see, do you feel better after? You know, uh, that, that thing that says, oh, I'm sore, I don't wanna move. Say, hey, guess what? You're gonna feel better after you move and trust that voice, trust that process. So I'm gonna skip through these next few lines because they talk about uh, different uh, things that they were doing in person. But here are the, the, the different uh, people that brought you this uh, presentation. You can see the Institute of Clinical Excellence. If you're interested, get online, look them up. They send out weekly emails that are phenomenal. I often use them on my Exercise Thursday. I use their research a lot. Uh, stave off is uh, something that's used by uh, certain physical therapists. If you're about to go to a physical therapist and you want one that comes from this way of thinking, get online at uh, Institute of Clinical Excellence or Modern Management of the Older Adult.com. You can just look that up. And they have courses. And then there's physical therapists in the area that advertise that they use this way of thinking. And you can go to them and you could say, look, I'm 70, but I'm not dead. I want, don't underdose me. And they'll be like, great, I don't wanna underdose you. I wanna make you as strong and as capable as possible. And that doesn't mean for a 70 year old, I mean, for a human, I wanna maximize your potential. So those are the folks that you want to, that you wanna go to. So I'm gonna stop sharing this for a second. So there you go. I know that was a lot of information, but I wanted a more clinical presentation about uh, arthritis for you all. Um, just, I know we don't have a ton of time. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, I see something in the, maybe in the chat. No, okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? If you do, you can unmute or you can be in the chat. If you wanna to listen to this again, we will be posting it on our YouTube page. As a little plug for those of you who aren't already involved in our uh, exercise classes, we do have them at the different uh, centers, not all the centers, but every center has some form of exercise. I encourage you to go in, try it out, meet some people, be social, move your body, um, Sometimes people will say, I can't do a lot, so I shouldn't come. No, no. There's a saying, fitness is wasted on the fit. People think that they can't go into exercise class because they're not fit enough. And it's so, it just hurts me because that's why we're there is to get you fit. So I don't care if you come in and sit and all you do is move your arms and legs on that chair. That's so much more because to get into that room, you had to stand up, even if you're at home, you at least had to stand up and go turn on the TV or the computer. But if you're going to a center, you had to get in the car or get on the bus, you had to get off the bus, walk into the center. I mean, think of how much activity that adds to your day. Maybe you meet some people that you like. We all know social isolation. We want to minimize it. Uh, if you're introverted like me, you don't need a lot, but we all need some. Find what your capacity is and lean on those senior centers. We have great programs, we have food, um, fun people. And remember, we have 15 of them around the county and you can go to any one of them. You don't have to go to the one in your neighborhood. You can branch out and try new things. I really appreciate your uh, attention. Thank you so much. If you have questions, please shoot me an email. I'll put it in the chat here. Um, and if you don't want and if you'd rather call me, I'll put that in as well. I do like talking on the phone, so that's not a problem. Um, let's see. We have some other uh, interesting things coming up here. We have four events starting in September for Falls Prevention. They're going to be at Draper on September 7th. Midvale on the 13th, Kearns on the 21st. They'll all be between 12.30 and 2.30. And for those of you who don't wanna get out of your house, there's a webinar on September 26th. And what we're gonna be talking about is fall prevention. September is National Fall Prevention Month. 
Remember, fall prevention is exercise, it's healthy eating, it's also making sure you wear your glasses, it's making sure your paths are clear in your house, but we'll be giving you a lot of different information. So join us in person at one of those, check out your senior scoop, there'll be more information about it. Uh, and thank you so much for your uh, participation, at least it seemed like the people I could see were, were listening and paying attention, so uh, thank you for that. And uh, I will, uh, I'm sure, see you all again at our next uh, presentation, which will be probably on September 26th about falls prevention. All right, everybody, have a wonderful day. Enjoy this cooler weather. It's nice out. Thank you.